Hello, I'm Trevor, and welcome to Bibles on the Bench. If this is your very first time with me, please let me extend a personal invitation for you to take out your Bibles and follow along as we go on a Bible adventure. And if you've been with me before, please allow me to thank you for your continued support and for inviting me back for another Bible adventure. So I'll tell you what, let's get right down to it and I will show you the Bibles that I personally use on this show. Now, I like to read my Bibles cover to cover and I find that it usually takes me about three to four months to do this. And I know that if you put the time behind it, you can do this too. It really isn't that difficult and I invite you to try it with me. But for tonight, we're going to be looking at all these Bibles, but individual scriptures and such to lead us on our Bible adventure. So, as promised, let's take a look at our Bibles. Now, the first Bible I like to use is the Holy Bible, the American Standard Version, that was published by the Gideons. And you can find this Bible in many places, but the most common place to actually find it is in the desks at the hotels and motels. This is the one they, they put in all the rooms. And the second Bible that I like to use is the New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures. This Bible is produced by the Jehovah's Witnesses. And at one point in time, yours truly was a Jehovah's Witness from 1990 to 1997. Hence my name in my profile. This Bible is out of print currently because the Jehovah's Witnesses have brought out a new version of the New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures. This is the one they carry around personally. You can find it in the literature carts or if they're going door to door. Just ask them to give you one. Um, but if you don't want to study with Jehovah's Witnesses, you have to tell them you just want the Bible and maybe leave it at that. Um, so the next Bible that I got is the New Jerusalem Bible. This one is very thick, as you can see, because it contains some of the apocryphal books, uh, ones that tell the history of the nation of Israel, like the books of Maccabees 1 and 2, as well as some of the books of wisdom and and those sort of books that are in here that you will not find in the regular Bible translations. The reason why I like to use this one is because in a lot of cases they will give you these footnotes at the bottom which give some extra insight into the Bible writers and what their meanings were when they wrote certain texts. And a final Bible that I really like to use is the New International Version the NIV. This is a study edition. And what makes this Bible really nice to use is that uh, here at the top, you know, of the page, they have the scriptures. And at the bottom, they have all these footnotes and references that tell you the meanings of the scriptures. Now, this Bible might cost you quite a bit more because this is one that you would get at a bookstore. Although you could also find it like I did with the Jerusalem Bible in the Reclaim Center. Now, or like a Salvation Army or any of those types of secondhand bookstores. And the Jerusalem Bible I ended up paying a dollar for, so it was quite a good find. However, as you follow along with me in these videos, you can also use your own Bible uh, or any Bible that you prefer, like the King James or the Tyndale Bible or any of those other Bibles that you personally like, because for the most part, all the scriptures are either translated or transliterated um, to have the very, very close meanings. Although you may find some Bibles where the translations are not quite um, following the other translations. So now, let us get into our topic for tonight. So, you might be asking, well, Trevor, why do you use five Bibles, actually? Now, the reason for this is so that you, yourself, can get a 
deeper understanding of what is actually being written in the Bible. Now, I want to share some scriptures um, to you so that you can get a little understanding of why it is important to look at some of the other Bibles. So first, we're going to start with this Bible that I read cover to cover, my first Bible that I read cover to cover, and that I used to use for seven years when I was a Jehovah's Witness. And I mean, this is, I don't know if you can tell because of the lights. Yes, there we go. You can see this Bible got some major use from myself. <laughs> you can even see the spine. So I invite you to turn with me to Philippians. Philippians. Uh, chapter 2. And I'd like to actually read verses 5 to 11. Now, Philippians, if you're new to the Bible, is in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, which is sort of toward the end of your Bible. Uh, Philippians is one of the letters that Paul wrote back in the day. <laughs> okay, so you go... F okay, so here's how this goes. It goes Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Acts. Romans. Um... Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, as you're flipping through, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and then you get Galatians, Ephesians, and after Ephesians is Philippians. Sorry for the little bit of a delay for those of you that are in a hurry here. Yes. So I like to say, let's flip to Philippians. Ha <laughs> ha. Just me being cute. Okay, Philippians chapter 5 to our verse chapter Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 to 11. 1984 New World Translation. Keep this mental attitude in you that was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he was existing in God's form, gave no consideration to his seizure, namely that he should be equal to God. No, but he emptied himself and took a slave's form and came to be in the likeness of men. More than that, when he found himself in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient as far as death. Yes, death on a torture stake. Unlike contemporary Christianity, Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe that Jesus was crucified but was impaled on a stake. Uh, just adding that in for a little background here. Okay, for this, verse 9, For this very reason also God exalted him to a superior position and kindly gave him the name that is above every, in brackets, other name. Other is in brackets. Can you see that? Every other name. So that in the name of Jesus, every knee should bend of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the ground, and every tongue should openly acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Okay. Now, let's read that in the 2013 version of the New World Translation, starting in verse 5. Keep this mental attitude in you that was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he was existing in God's form, gave no consideration to a seizure, namely, that he should be equal to God. No, but he emptied himself and took a slave's form and became human. Now they put a star under human. So verse 7, in their footnotes down here, it says, literally came to be in the likeness of men. So, so if you add that in, it says, No, but he emptied himself and took a slave's form and came to be in the likeness of men. Uh, okay. Likeness of men. More than that, when he came as a man, now they put another star here, literally, when he was found in appearance as a man, appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, 
Yes, death on a torture stake, again, with the stake. For this very reason, God exalted him to a superior position and kindly gave him the name that is above every other name, so that in the name of Jesus, every knee should bend of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the ground, and every tongue should openly acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And now... As you can see, there are some differences between 1984 and 2013. Interestingly, verse 9, verse 9, when it says every other name, those brackets that were in 1984 are gone. Um, now that is something that is interesting and unique to Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, you have the two Jehovah's Witness Bibles. Now, the American Standard Version, which interestingly, interestingly enough, is noted in the Bibles at jw.org, the Jehovah's Witness website. It has this Bible. Now, if we read the same scriptures, you will note some interesting differences here. Having this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus, sorry, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. Now they have a one. This is how they do their, their notes. They have a one in front of emptied. So this says, laid aside his privileges. So if we want to reread that, but, okay, uh, but Jesus laid aside his privileges, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. So this uses the common contemporary knowledge of the Roman crucifixions, which existed, where the Romans historically, and you can find this on a Google search, nailed their victims to a cross. Okay, verse 9. For this reason also God highly exalted him, Jesus, And bestowed on him, Jesus, the name which is above every other, sorry, above every name. Above every name. This is different from the New World Translations that put in brackets, other name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Now you'll note that... Oh. Yeah, you'll note that where it says every knee shall bow, they actually change the font. Now, the American Standard Version changes the font because whenever they quote from the Old Testament, they use a different font in here so that the reader knows that it's being quoted out of the Old Testament. So at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, capital L. Yes, there. this is a something that I'll show you in a second. Capital L for Lord. So the highest Lord. To the glory of God the Father. So I'll read 11 again. And that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Now, if we just skip back into the New World Translation for half a second, you will also notice that they did the same thing. Jesus Christ is Lord with a capital L. And in 1984, and Jesus Christ is capital L. O R D. Oops. Sorry, this camera sometimes has a focal plane adjustment issue. <laughs> okay. 
So in three instances, these Bibles say that every knee shall bend to Jesus Christ, the L, capital L O R D, Lord. Now, this is where we get, we get into some interesting things. So we, we discovered a subnote in the American Standard Version of emptied himself, which means that, that uh, Jesus gave up his heavenly privileges to come down to earth as a man. So now, in the Jerusalem Bible, which has some more of these notes at the bottom, we will read this here. So, verses 5. In your minds you must be the same as Christ Jesus. A. A. <laughs> I know I'm Canadian, but... No, uh, there isn't either. So it says, 2A, verses 6 to 11 are a hymn, or a religious song, though whether composed or only quoted by Paul is uncertain. So in verses 6 to 11, now this is what the other three Bibles didn't show, that this is actually a song that the Apostle Paul is singing. So this is some more insight that you're getting out of reading various Bibles, but the same scriptures, see? In your minds, you must be the same as Christ Jesus. His state was divine, yet he did not cling to his equality with God, but emptied himself to assume the condition of a slave and became as men are. And being as all men are, he was humbler yet, even to accept death, death on a cross. But God raised him high and gave him the name which is above all other names, so that all beings in the heavens, on earth, and in the underworld should bend the knee. D. Isaiah 45 and 23. Bend the knee at the name of Jesus, and that every tongue should acclaim Jesus Christ as Lord, to the glory of God the Father. And again, Jesus Christ uh, as capital L-O-R-D, Lord. And now... As our final resource, we have the NIV Study Edition. And we will read again these passages. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature, E, or in the form of, who being in the very form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature, F, or the form, taking the very form of a servant being made in human likeness, like Adam. Let us make Adam in our own likeness. That's Genesis. Being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. And again, wrapping this concept up, Lord with a capital L. So all five, two, three, all five of these Bibles that I use refers to Jesus as capital L-O-R-D. Now, what makes a study Bible? Very good. Is these are their footnotes in the study Bible. Now what I want to read to you here as a conclusion to this thought that I'm bringing up, that it is very good to read a lot of Bibles to deepen your understanding of the scriptures. Okay, so now here is what makes this interesting. And this is quoted in history as well by many people that describe crucifixion. Now this is in verse 2 and 8. And the reason why um, saying, you know, death on a stake 
versus what Roman crucifixion really and truly is. If you do a Google search, you'll find the information here, too, in agreement with this. Okay, so death on a cross, crucifixion, was the form of capital punishment that Romans used for notorious criminals. It was excruciatingly painful and humiliating. Prisoners were nailed or tied to a cross and left to die. Death might not come for several days, and it usually came by suffocation, when the weight of the weakened body made breathing more and more difficult. So with your arms out and your body sinking in the middle, it's compressing your lungs. Okay. And making your breathing more and more difficult. Jesus died as one who was cursed. And they they quote Galatians 3 and 13. And they end the sentence. <laughs> Jesus died as one who was cursed. How amazing that the perfect man should die this most shameful death so that we would not have to face eternal punishment. In other words, they're saying this awful, horrible death that Jesus died, being convicted as a criminal when he was not, um, this all occurred so that man could get salvation of sins. Okay, now here is their um, commentary on verses 9 and 11 of chapter 2. At the last judgment, even those who are condemned will recognize Jesus' authority and right to rule. People can choose to regard Jesus as Lord, capital L O R D, now as a step of willing and loving commitment, or be forced to acknowledge him as Lord when he returns, capital L O R D. Christ may return at any moment. The question is, are you prepared to meet him? So, these are interesting things to consider. And remember the depth that we got. Now, let's just review this here. And now, from the original New World Translation that I had as Jehovah's Witness, the depth of the scriptures did not go deeper than the written text. We did not know that that was a hymn that was being quoted. Now, the New World Translation for 2013 is still semi-vague, although they are adding in some, uh, you know, footnotes and details to get you a little deeper on your Bible reading. But the American Standard Version, when it said, you know, if you ever wonder what it means when it says Christ emptied himself, in that footnote, it says laid aside his privileges. So Christ was full of heavenly privileges and these sort of things that he set aside so that he could become a man and be in our condition as mortal. This you get out of the American Standard Version, which is a concept that is not, you know, referred to in the New World Translations. And, of course, when you read in the Jerusalem Bible, you go even deeper, because now you know that this is a hymn from verses 6 to 11. And then to get your ultimate depth, you get the Study Application Bible. And all those commentaries are really helpful in you learning the scriptures. So that, my friends, is why I use all these different Bibles to get my knowledge of biblical things as deeply as I can, right from the very source, the Bible. So now that we have a good understanding of why to use a few different Bibles to get more of the depth of the matter of, of the scriptures you're reading, I'd like to now read from the 2013 New World Translation on the Holy Scriptures. One of the scriptures that I do think that the Watchtower Society has translated very nicely, and that is 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16. And this is something to keep in mind when you consider Bible topics 
and the topic we're going to cover tonight. 2 Timothy 3 and 16. All scripture is inspired of God and beneficial for teaching, for reproving, for setting things straight. And there's a little star after straight, which reads, or correcting. For disciplining in righteousness, so that the man of God may be fully competent, completely equipped for every good work. And I like how they translated that. So, now, the topic I want to discuss is birthdays. Are they... Actually, my birthday is coming up soon, May 26th. So, birthdays. Is it something that we can celebrate in the Bible? Or is it something that is not good to celebrate because of what's written in the Bible. So let's get into this little Bible adventure of ours and see what the answer is. So birthdays, are we able to celebrate them or not? Well, let's take a look at two examples of birthdays that we can find in the New World Translation. And then we will carry on in our research afterwards here. So the first one is in Genesis 40 and verse 20. I'll uh, let you look for that and hopefully you have it. Genesis is of course the first book in the Bible. Okay so Genesis 40 and verse 20. Now the third day was Pharaoh's birthday and he made a feast for all his servants and he brought out both the chief cupbearer and the chief baker in the presence of his servants. This is from the 2013 edition. Um, servants. And he returned the chief cupbearer to his post of cupbearer, and he continued to hand the cup to Pharaoh. But he, but Pharaoh, he hanged the chief baker, just as Joseph had, been, had interpreted to them. So, Pharaoh, there was two men in prison. One was the chief cupbearer, and the other was the chief baker. And at this birthday party of Pharaoh's, Pharaoh hung the chief baker. So there was an execution at this birthday party. Now, let us find the second example of a birthday party which went wrong. <laughs> or had bad consequences. So that example of a, a a birthday party that was a negative birthday party was found in the Old Testament, or the Hebrew Scriptures, as the New World Translation calls them. And the second example of a birthday where that had detrimental effects is in the New Testament, or as the Hebrew Scriptures, or the the New World Translation calls it the Hebrew or the Greek scriptures. So from the Greek scriptures or the New Testament, we look at Mark chapter six and twenty-one, which I'll read out of the twenty thirteen edition of the New World Translation. But a convenient day arrived when Herod spread an evening meal on his birthday for his high officials and the military commanders and the most prominent men of Galilee. And the daughter of Herod came in and danced and pleased Herod and those dining with him. The king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you want, and I will give it to you. Yes, he swore to you, Whatever you ask me for, I will give it to you up to half my kingdom. So she went out and said to her mother, What should I ask for? She said, The head of John the baptizer. She immediately rushed to the king and made her request, saying, I want you to give me right away on a platter the head of John the Baptist. Although this deeply grieved him, the king did not want to disagree or disregard her request because of his oaths and his guests. Um, guess. So the king immediately sent a bodyguard and commanded him to bring John's head. So they went off and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter. He gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. Okay, so in both those situations, 
the leader in charge had a man executed. Pharaoh had the baker executed, and Herod, who was the king of the Jewish nation at the time, had John the Baptist decapitated. So there's two instances where people died. Now, with this in mind, is it really bad to celebrate birthdays or not? Well, this is where we need to look into our Bibles and find a few other examples of birthdays. Now, let's take a look again in Genesis. And we will find some scriptures that shed a different light on birthdays. So, let's read an account. Now, we're going to switch to the 1984 New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures. So, if you have one of these in your collection, turn with me to Genesis 21 and verse 8, and you'll find something quite interesting here. Verse 8, Now the child kept growing and came to be weaned. And Abraham then prepared a big feast on the day of Isaac's being weaned. Now, you'll notice here, if you can zoom in, that after the word weaned, there's a little letter H. Now, the letter H refers to something in the center column. Now, let's just take a look at this. So, H in the first column refers us to 1 Samuel 1 and 22. So, I'll give you a minute to find that in your Bibles. You could pause this video right now and, well, find the scripture and then unpause the video. So let's go and check this out. All right, so we will grab our 2013 edition of the New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures. And it was 1 Samuel 1 and 22. Now this is the life story of Samuel when he was a baby. And Samuel is one of the key prophets in the Old Testament or the Hebrew groups, Greek scriptures. So 1 and 22, but Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, as soon as a boy is weaned, so between here and Abraham, uh, both boys are being weaned, so they're babies, um, nursing babies. So when they're weaned, they're no longer, well, breastfed. <laughs> so this is the weaning part here. Okay, so, but Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, As soon as the boy is weaned, I will bring him. Then he will appear before Jehovah, or Yahweh, which is God, and remain there from then on. Now here again, at the end of there, and interestingly enough, it is another letter H. So what do they refer to here? In the second column, it refers to 1 Samuel 1 and 1, 1 Samuel 2 and 1, oh, sorry, 1 Samuel 1, 11, and 1 Samuel 2, 11, and 2 Chronicles 31 and 16. So, let's see what it says in 2 Chronicles. which should be Second Chronicles 31 and 16. Well, heh, just turned right to it. And from the 2013 New World Translation, this was in addition to the distribution made to the males from three years old and up who were listed in the genealogical enrollment who came daily to serve in the house of Jehovah and to carry out the duties of their divisions. So from three years old and up, this is when they would have begun um, this service to come into the house of God and to carry out the duties of their divisions. So three years old and up. So the point here is 
as soon as these boys were weaned, which was on their third birthday, they were presented. So what happened on their third birthday? Well, let's dig a little deeper into our Bibles and see what happened. So using again the 2013 New World Translation, we go back to Genesis 21 and 8. Now the child grew and was weaned, and Abraham, now note what he does, prepared a big feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. Keep in mind that they, the weaning date was when they became three years old. So in that case, on the day he became three, they had a big feast. Would this not constitute it being a good birthday? And if it was, why did God, who gave all his power, well, his approval to Abraham as the chosen nation, decide that it was okay to have this birthday feast if the other two birthdays, which were very bad, um, are an indication that we should not celebrate birthdays. But in this case, this was a good approved birthday. And on the topic of feasts, we can also look to the book of Job. And for the book of Job, we will again look at the New World Translation and look at Job 1 and 4. Each of his sons would hold a banquet at his house on his own set day. They would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. After a series of banquet days was complete, Job would send for them in order to sanctify them. Okay, so again, we have banquet feasts of Job's children at their houses on their own set day. Now, the New World Translation has, at the end of day, it's there's an asterisk, and it says, or at the house of each one in his turn. So why is it okay for a the patriarch, Abraham, Father Abraham, the most blessed of characters in the... Uh, Old Testament to be able to have a birthday party for his son. Is there any answer for this? Well, I'll let you leave that in the comments if you wish. All right, so since the Bible shows that there were two birthdays in which two people had lost their lives, and yet one birthday that was okay by God, we have to really question why the two birthdays that are so popularized by certain people that do not like to celebrate birthdays, why these two birthdays uh, are always being referenced? What really was the driving force behind those um, problems of two people being executed? So, let's again look into our Bibles and try to dig up the answer to this question. All right, so the question remains here. What is the, the true evil of birthdays? Is it the celebration itself or events that could have happened uh, during the birthday that uh, cause the problems? So I'm going to read again from the 2013 New World Translation, and I invite you to read Genesis 9 and verse 20. Now, many of you know of Noah and the Ark, and this is something that happened after the floods receded and Noah and his family departed from the Ark and began start to restart their life in the the new um, post-flood world. 
Okay, so in 9 and 20 it says, Now Noah started off as a farmer, and he planted a vineyard. Now here's, a, here's where the problem starts. When he drank of the wine, he became intoxicated, and he uncovered himself inside his tent. Ham, the father of Cana, or Canaan, saw his father, father's nakedness, and he told his two brothers outside. So here Ham, Noah's son, and the father of Canaan, came in and saw Noah uh, being drunk in a bad state here. Uh, and he told his two brothers outside. So Shem and Japheth, the two brothers of Ham, took a garment and put it upon both their shoulders, and they walked in backwards so they couldn't see their father in this depraved state. Thus they covered their father's nakedness while their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father's nakedness. So when Noah woke up from his wine and learned what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Curse be Canaan, let him become the lowest slave to his brothers. Okay, so this is the thing. Because Noah became intoxicated here, so he drank alcohol to a point beyond what he can, could control, and was discovered by Ham, an entire nation was cursed. So we can see here that drinking alcohol can lead to a curse. And in this case, it was a curse on a nation. Now, what other examples do we have of this sort of same thing happening? Well, again, let us look into some Bibles to see what else happened. So now here is another incident that happened in the Bible, not because of a birthday party, but because of alcohol. So this time around, let's read the Jerusalem Bible, since I quoted it earlier, and I actually sort of didn't get a chance to read, you know, something that I didn't just previously read. But at any rate, okay, so it says the origin of the Moabites and the Ammonites. And this is what I like about, another thing I like about the Jerusalem Bible, they give you a a little subtitle to uh, allow you to understand what you're reading in these passages. Okay, Genesis 19 and 30. So after leaving Zor, Lot settled in the hill country with his two daughters. So this is right after um, Lot's uh, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, and when Lot's wife turned around and became the pillar of salt. So, uh, they settled in Zor, and then afterwards Lot moved out of Zor. So, after leaving Zor, Lot settled in the hill country with his two daughters, for he dared not stay at Zor. He made his home in a cave, himself and his two daughters. The elder said to the younger, so the older daughter said to the younger, our father is an old man, and there is not a man in the land to marry us in the way they do the world over. Now, this is the point here. Come, let us ply our father with wine and sleep with him. In this way we shall have children by our father. That night they made their father drunk, and the elder slept with her father, though he was unaware of her coming to bed, or of her leaving. The next day the elder said to the younger, Last night I slept with my father. Let us make him drunk again tonight, and you go and sleep with him. In this way we shall have children by our father. They made their father drunk that night too, and the younger went and slept with him. But he was unaware of her coming to bed or of her leaving. Both Lot's daughters thus became pregnant by their father, the elder gave birth to a son whom she named Moab, and he is the ancestor of the Moabites of our own times. The younger also gave birth to a son whom she named ben -Amin, and he is the ancestor of the ben -Amon of our own times. And then they give you a C here as a reference. 
folk etymology. Moab is explained as from Miab, from my father. Ben Ami, son of my kinsman, is associated with sons of Ammon. So, yes, again, you can see that alcohol was the, uh, I guess you'd say, evil force in this story here. Um, alcohol and the loss of reasoning and the loss of, well, memory for Lot here. But again, what is the culprit? Alcohol. So now let's go to a third scripture here to see again about alcohol. All right, let us examine the NIV study edition of the Bible. And we will turn to 2 Samuel chapter 13 and verse 26. Another story here. Then Absalom said, If not, please let my brother Amon come with us. The king asked him, Why should he go with you? But Absalom urged him, so he sent with him Amon and the rest of the king's sons. Absalom ordered his men, Listen, when Ammon is in high spirits from drinking wine, I say to you, Strike Amon down, then kill him. Don't be afraid. Have I not given you this order? Be strong and brave. So Absalom's men did to Ammon what Absalom had ordered. Then all the king's sons got up, mounted their mules, and fled. So, again, what was the driving force behind this? Alcohol. His brother, uh, Amon, or Absalom, uh, ordered his men when Ammon is high in high spirits from drinking wine to kill him. So, so at any rate, again, what was the driving factor? Was it, well, it was alcohol. Alcohol is the key into these things. All right, so I want to bring your attention to uh, 1 Corinthians 6. In verse 10. It's a little bit of a, a back story here in verse 9. Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Uh, okay. Do not be deceived. Thieves nor greedy thieves nor the greedy nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. Okay. So, with the, that scripture there, we see that part of the people that will not inherit the kingdom of God are the drunkards. Now, with those three scriptures in mind, the drunkards, well, what did they do? There was a cursing of a nation, there was incest, and there was murder. All three instances were because of drinking. Now, would this mean that if Abraham was able to give Isaac a birthday party when he was weaned at three years of age, on the day of his weaning, which would be his birthday, and yet Pharaoh and um, Herod had those parties where people died. Could we not conclude that there would have been drinking at the parties of the Pharaoh and Herod? Perhaps heavy drinking? Again, the Bible associates here drinking with a lot of bad problems that come, which also makes it a sin. So, keep that in mind. Next time someone says, Happy Birthday, <laughs> Um, what, or that having a birthday, if you don't drink and, you know, eat birthday cake and, you know, that kind of thing, will probably fare you far better than a birthday party where everybody is 
drunk and out of control and there's murder and rape and incest and all kinds of crazy sinful horrible things going on at said party so really it's not the birthday parties that are bad but what happens in the birthday parties the way you make the birthday party that could determine whether you're sinful or or well will lead to a sinful birthday party or not now my birthday coming up i hope to not have like <laughs> drunkenness to the point of someone getting murdered nor will i be drinking in total excess to actually put a murder on somebody because really that's not the way i want my birthday to go i i kind of like to have my wife and kids there you know my in-laws and everybody else that i love and so on and probably you know have birthday cake and watch a movie <laughs> so yeah really biblically biblically from what we observed the answer is yes you can have a birthday yes it is in the bible but again heed the bible's warning and do not invite all those things of sin into your birthday like drunkenness fornication and on we go so this is bibles on the bench i hope you enjoyed spending some time with me today on this uh bible quest that we went on it's quite the interesting adventure and i hope you all think about these sort of things and uh, leave comments below with some scriptures and references and again i encourage you to look for bibles definitely to read them cover to cover get the full story of what's going on in your bible and also again look into other bibles as well because again we get some depth and clarity by comparing scriptures from bibles side by side and that sort of thing so again i invite you to you know i'm going to invite you to look in the side windows or maybe it's this side i'm not sure because i am not sitting in front of a computer but look at the sides here and look at related videos wherever they are and you can also click on my profile and view other bibles on the bench earlier works i'm sort of trying a new format here i'm using the the curtain back here and that sort of thing and and dressing with my new bowler hat <laughs> and uh not wearing my old frock sort of eh, maybe up up a next little notch or so in my uh, production value but it's been quite an adventure and i'm glad you came along and really enjoyed you know looking up scriptures with you and you know it's not very complicated to read the bible you can't actually get a good concept of what's going on you, uh I would suggest you know start at genesis and work your way to revelation but if you want to just read something from the bible it's that'll give you a good idea of what's uh what the the best parts are i would i would say really look into the new testament maybe start with matthew matthew mark luke or john and uh see what they have to say Again, where you want to start is where you want to start. It's your book. So enjoy your book given to you by people divinely inspired to write it. So, yes, <laughs> I'm kind of rambling on. Okay, so we'll see you next time on Bibles on the Bench. Thanks for watching.